lessons learned task force meeting uh, in which we're going to talk about uh, the work of our project to date uh, as uh, the audience may or may not know, but certainly those of us here know, we have broken ourselves into three subgroups, uh, each of which uh, will pursue uh, uh, a variety of conversations uh, with the standing committees and uh, some cross-government functions. Uh, we've limited ourselves to talking internally uh, within the legislature and uh, have not had a, a great deal of conversation with leaders in the administration. And we've decided that uh, just given the time and scope of what we're doing to concentrate ourselves on, on the legislative uh, uh, activities and also what we have picked up in the in testimony uh, to our committees uh, during the course of the pandemic. And that in itself is, is obviously larger than the red box. Our goal in all of this is to uh, come up with the findings. Uh, and these findings are at a very high level uh, over the course of uh, really a three week period. Uh, and then to memorialize those into things that have gone well, things that perhaps have been improvement, uh, areas that uh, may need mid-course correction now as we work on the, uh, the, the pandemic. And then lastly, uh, some lessons learned that we may apply to the future. Uh, today, uh, I think what we'd like to do is hear from each of the heads of the three subgroups to summarize the findings and perhaps talk a little bit about some of the high level things that each group has found thus far. Then following that, uh, we hope we'll have a committee discussion uh, that will uh, tell us, A, are there areas that we need to do more work on this week as we finalize what we do? Are there things that we have not yet gotten to that uh, folks want to mention? Are there things that we should do that we haven't done uh, that based on what we've learned so far uh, from the subgroups and then uh, to course correct ourselves for the end the goal in all of this is we have another group of uh, meeting of the three leaders of the subgroups uh, on Thursday. We have a meeting of this entire group again on Friday afternoon, by which time we should have at least a draft, uh, uh, a rough draft of our findings. And then uh, I've talked with Tim and we have a dispensation until the beginning of the following week, like Tuesday of the following week to get a final report done and that way we can make sure that Becca and I in particular have our weekend planned for next weekend in order to write the final report. Uh, so that said, uh, perhaps uh, Becca, do you have anything that you want to mention at this point to the group? Uh, mostly I just want to thank people. I know everyone's just so flat out with all the other work that they're doing, but I do think it's important for us to take a few minutes and reflect. And I certainly found it really helpful to hear from both my committees and to see the themes that emerged um, throughout, you know, as, as we're thinking about it, there are definitely some takeaways that seem generally um, acceptable or, or rather things that we all can agree on and um, pointing us in particular directions that we need more information on. So I found it useful. Great. great. Uh, as we start talking about what the groups have done, perhaps if we start with Chris, uh, could you kind of touch on the high points and, uh, and, and so on of the findings in your draft as of this point? Oh, you're booted. you're still muted. Uh, yeah, here we go. Okay, so uh, I mean, you want to just me to? I won't read this whole thing. Um, sure. But I can sort of skip over or skip through most of it. Uh, I wanted to give a sort of an overview. It's not related only to our group, but as I would assume that our final report would have uh, an introduction. I, I we offered. Uh, and this was just my draft, so I don't know if my team would agree, but just sort of some of the larger economic pictures, right? I mean, I think we've got to, any lesson learned document has to acknowledge the weakness, weak points of our economy that have really uh, come home during this pandemic when, so, you know, almost half Vermonters have no savings and 
I think it's, I, I'm, we're trying to find these data points. Uh, 5% of lenders have about a thousand bucks of savings. These are dynamics that uh, I think are worth noting. Uh, and then as we rolled through the committees and, and areas we were assigned, um, judiciary gave us a good summary. Uh, Sears reports, uh, quote, most elements of the system responded fairly well. He credits corrections for dealing with uh, the outbreak at Northwest um, and uh, had a bit of experience of pushback from St. John's Ray, but as we know, we transferred um, prisoners to St. Johnsbury as it became a sort of COVID site uh, intentionally and did a fairly good job releasing some offenders who they thought that was appropriate. He noted the courts uh, were able to slow down the pace of new admissions uh, to prison. So that kept the population kind of stable. Uh, right out of the gate, he expressed uh, a wish that there had been better uh, planning around enforcement of the governor's stay-at-home order. Said it took some time to understand the division between law enforcement, the attorney general, et cetera, but ultimately they smoothed that out. Uh, one thing that um, they clearly signaled as a problem, which won't surprise you, is the closure of Woodside. Uh, then they, they, they brought the uh, juveniles up to another home up in St. Albans, I believe, Randy. Mm -hmm. And people broke out of that. It was, the, the, the facility was completely inadequate. They hadn't uh, installed needed security measures, et cetera. They had several runways. Then they moved them to Middlesex, also inadequate, also led to problems. Um, and this was all under the guise that Woodside might be for mental health beds if there was a COVID outbreak around, uh, I guess, mental health facilities. And that never happened. So it was all uh, a contingency plan that was never needed, actually. Um, so that was for judiciary. Do you want me to stop and see if there are questions or should I keep going? Well, if the, yeah, I certainly, if, if there are any questions for, for Chris at this point. I'm on a smallish screen, so when I'm reading, I can't see you, so just chime in. Um, and, and maybe I'll turn to Andy and Brian. Any, anything, does that cover it, or we're remembering anything else? No, that's, that's good. good. In ag, um, where Brian and I both sit, um, you know, it's high, the, the crisis highlights several infrastructure challenges, uh, both for, for food infrastructure and for ag uh, economics. Um, we don't really have a coordinated system to move food from farms to markets, uh, and especially local food and local markets. And our infrastructure, I would say broadly, is, is very dependent on imports, right? For food products, for other household goods. Um, and at the same time, food banks are challenged to keep up with the demand. We saw over the weekend, 1,900 cars up at Berlin at that food drop. Uh, and I know those have been wildly um, high demand at all of those sites across the state. Um, and the, as a state, uh, it's come clear that we are more dependent on a single commodity than in any other state, that being dairy. And so we, that does leave us vulnerable. Uh, in this case, there's reduced demand for dairy. And of course, already our, our dairy economy was struggling. Um, and therefore, a large portion of our farm-based economy is exposed in that sense. Uh, also been some unique challenges among dairy who is uh, especially dependent on migrant workers. Migrant workers have sort of been left out of virtually all of the response from the federal government um, and uh, have tr uh, trouble accessing healthcare, although that has gotten better because federal funds will cover uninsured. Um, 
And then there's just a language barrier for um, Spanish speakers or migrant workers who are trying to learn how to cope in this crisis with significant la language barriers uh, with farm owners and, and the bosses. So that um, highlights some opportunities, certainly some vulnerabilities. There's not been, um, you know, any clear crisis. There has been milk being um, <coughs> dumped elsewhere in the country. I don't think a lot in Vermont that we've heard of, um, but that has been some of the challenges there. At the same time, actually, non-dairy producers have seen a, a swell in demand and some of their lack of infrastructure has been highlighted uh, as people have been scrambling for local food. So some op real opportunities there. In natural resources, um, we didn't get a lot. I had one conversation with Chair Bray um, and the agency um, didn't report too much in terms of uh, need to react, but one example, and I, and I trying to figure out this out a little bit better, but wastewater managers, people that work at our wastewater facilities, apparently their license is, is somehow linked to that facility. And one of the things they realized and, and corrected was that was a problem when we had working and personnel issues at other wastewater facilities and they couldn't call, you know, South, I'll make this up, South Burlington couldn't call people from Burlington to come help them because the license bar, it, it would be as if you had a medical license that only allowed you to practice at uh, Porter Hospital. So they somehow opened up some flexibility um, to allow those licenses and those workers to, to drift between facilities. Um, as we know, the other one was around trash haulers and recycle haulers, um, waste management districts have consolidated access. Um, in Chittenden County, we can only go to Williston to the one more central uh, drop point. Um, and I th as far as I know, that has been uh, worked pretty well and gone smoothly. Um, so any, anything else there, Senator Perchley? I thought I saw you unmute. No, I just changed my name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, there was not much to report in transportation. Um, the, there was some steps that, that we took, as you'll remember, through um, some of our early GovOps bills around DMV timeline uh, without access to the DMV, uh, normal penalties around renewing your license in 15 days or um, some of the commercial truck registrations um, we, we relaxed access or relaxed some of the timelines um, through DMV, and that seemed to go pretty smoothly. Uh, we had uh, on our sheet broadband uh, infrastructure issues uh, as a broad assignment, which I, I suspect all of us looked at at some point. So we just flagged some questions. I think we'll flesh this out a little more this week. Broadband is one meat processing, food processing. Um, and then a question that I'd appreciate some feedback from this group. Should we look at other potential disasters? Uh, for example, something might link to energy. We import a lot of our energy. Uh, if there was a natural disaster that, you know, really walloped Quebec, like the ice storm 20 years ago, uh, we would be vulnerable to about a third of our power. Um, there is a lot of belief that in the coming years, we will link up to offshore wind in Massachusetts. So in some ways we'll have, uh, you know, most of our power coming from two sources beyond our control. And, you know, just, just uh, are, uh, is there any opportunity or need for us to try to think about not just COVID, but other infrastructure we should look at in other kinds of disasters. And I guess I'd stop there and ask a question. Okay. Are, are there any questions? I can't see everyone uh, on, on the screens because I'm limited uh, to, to nine at a time. So please speak up if, if there, there are, are questions for Chris. 
well, do you want us to, you know, should we do anything about other disasters or are we really? Uh, I, I think I think we should, uh, because that is, is one of the things I know that in, in terms of, of, of looking at what my group has done, uh, part of, of, of what we've done is what should we do better to prepare for the next crisis? And one of those things is we have to think through uh, and, and kind of almost do a, a, a risk assessment of what are the other kinds of crises. Because one of the things that we're seeing is we were well prepared on continuity of government plans to deal with uh, floods and hurricanes, but pandemics was for a lot of the planning was not really there. Yeah. And now we know that there are other kinds of crises that, that, that can affect us. Uh, I mean, just basic infrastructure things like, well, we, we, we are backing up all the records in the tax department and we have offsite ability to do it. But what happens if the tax department building blows up and you lose all the people who know how to use the systems? What do we do then? And those are, those are some of the questions and, and they are at this stage only questions, but kind of thinking through other kinds of disasters and the one that you mentioned, such as uh, energy issues, the loss of of, of major portions of the grid could be significant to us. Okay, well, we'll I, uh, I should try to touch on those things at least. Not necessarily think through every disaster that could happen, but look at weaknesses that this perhaps is exposed in, in, in that area. Well, even just asking the question um, could prompt somebody else to think about it down the road. Yep. Uh, then we shifted to our, our own behavior as the Senate. Um, and flagged that uh, you know we were the all Senate calls uh, we got going right away. They were very effective, brought us together. Uh, it allowed um, uh, and and was really important and and well done in the first few weeks of stay at home when we were all scrambling to understand what was going on. Um, we thought that the use of joint rules and Senate rules to coordinate get information out to legislative leaders and then the full bodies also worked well and it got even easier once once it became live on youtube um and uh the ability for legislators ourselves and the public to access committee hearings was helpful once that system got smoothed out uh, we didn't get into what could we have done better uh and i'm sure we will spend some time there it's similar what changes should be made we, we've got some work to do there uh, we did go down to opportunity for improvement um, noted that public access has been uh i think broadly positive that that people can watch us more easily since it's all video from home committee discussions are videoed but that there are we noted a few people who their access had been coming to the state house and now they can't do that. And in fact, uh, for some, there is a, a access uh, payment. There's a fee to access if you don't have broadband or if your phone is paid by the minute. So just noted that it's not universally positive. And of course, our public resources like a library, which might uh, get you around having to pay your own accounts or your own equipment are closed, so that that does uh, create some issues. Um, other lessons learned, uh, activity of Senate committees and uh, Senate resources was somewhat uneven. The committee structure, you know, has that baked in at some level and worked well on many issues at once, but then other committees didn't meet it at well at all. Um, so there, it was uneven and we weren't maybe drawing on, on the expertise of all 30 senators. Um, and then we thought it, it might make sense and, and, you know, I, I wouldn't claim to have spent a lot of time reorganizing this, so maybe this should go somewhere else, but that we may be smart to, um, pull together a packet, a catalog of the emergency bills that we passed very quickly and just have them in a file somewhere so that if next February something rolls through and there's a stay-at-home order, you know, there's one big bill that, that people can turn to and, and have some confidence that that will facilitate ongoing local government and state government. Um, anyway, so that was a thought 
um, that that might be smart for us to consider moving forward. And that's what we've got at this point. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks very much. Any any questions for Chris at this point? Okay. Uh, let's let's move then to Becca and, and your let, group. Let me just invite Brian or or Andy if if. Uh, oh sure. You know, we all sort of dumped it together a document, but I want to make sure yep. I covered it. We did. Yeah, that was the good. The only other thing that I heard from some folks about public access and just how we've ha had to do it quickly was our reliance on Zoom or, or YouTube. These other companies where we didn't have the time to check their privacy policies. And, and does the state want to be so dependent on on these other corporations for such a essential service as legislating? It's something to think about if there's any other, I don't know if there is another option, but. Yeah, there are. Uh, so that's a question. The question is, do, do, should, should we have a backup to Zoom? Yeah. Right. Part of our contingency planning. Right. Good idea. Anything else, guys? Okay. Becca? So I wanna make sure I don't uh, recover the material that that Chris went over because a lot of the themes are the same yeah. um, but I do want to say that um, in general the sense was that as, as a Senate we did work well together and got up and running nimbly in a pretty short time and good communication between the governor's team and the Senate and you know to a large extent something that went well was for the first you know big chunk of the initial emergency, political agendas were put away, and many senators felt like there were uh, there was a very strong sense of everybody working on the same goal, which was just making sure that we were taking care of Vermonters and getting information out to them as quickly um, as and efficiently as possible. We did a pretty successful job of pivoting to a new kind of work. Um, we learned that remote working was possible for us as a body, which before had been just a theoretical possibility. The IT staff did an amazing job with a very small number of people and the uh, committee assistants really had to change their game and the way that they were doing their work. And um, people felt like, it really went as smoothly as it possibly could have without us not having any plan in place beforehand. As Chris said, holding the Zoom meetings been more transparent for a lot of people. Um, an interesting thought from one of the committee chairs, they felt like this format uh, led to witnesses providing more detailed and complete answers that they felt like there was less hedging in testimony, uh, possibly because there was a video record that uh, whether consciously or unconsciously, he felt like they gave more full uh, responses to our questions. It was also a sense from a number of senators that they saw silos between departments and agencies coming down to some extent, it seemed to be better communication both across um, state government and between uh, the various agencies and departments and the uh, legislature. And um, someone mentioned that there was greater flexibility in getting legislation packs because we were able to relax some uh, regulations, um, some structures and enable to address the emergency. Another interesting byproduct was that committees felt like they were much more informed about what other committees were doing. And it was an in, it's interesting because I know there's been talk for years about having either the clerk of a committee or a vice chair write a synopsis of what was happening. And in the past, that has felt like just too much of a burden when we're in the state house and there's so much happening. But for some reason, this emergency allowed people the whether it was the space, the headspace to be able to do it or just the realization that it was a much needed bit of information to, for other senators to have. The synopsis um, that each clerk was writing for the committees was very helpful to senators to know what was going on. Uh, let me make sure. A number of people commented that the governor's daily press conferences were helpful 
in not just uh, informing us and citizens, but also in reassuring them and that going forward, whenever there's an emergency, there needs to be a point person in government who's going to be taking that role. In this instance, it was the governor and the Department of Health. Um, it may be a different uh, person and we might wanna flesh out who those people uh, make some suggestions for who those people might be. But I remember on joint rules early in our conversations, the feeling of who is going to start making the public statements. And there was a few day lag time early on. And I think um, generally the response from the governor's team was, was very good. But I do remember a few days early on when a number of senators felt like we need somebody out in front right away reassuring people that we've got a handle on what's happening. Okay, a big win for um, the state and for the homeless population was that the Agency of Human Services and the legislature and all the housing advocates were able to house every single um, homeless person in Vermont and get them out of shelters. Anyone that was seeking um, a safe place to be was provided with that, which is remarkable. We didn't have, uh, I believe at this point, we still have not had one COVID-19 infection reported among the homeless population, which stands in stark contrast to what happened in Massachusetts and New York. So we're really looking to continue that work. So to, to uh, Chris's point, the nature of work has changed and thousands of Vermonters are working remotely. The question is, is that sustainable? What happens if the grid goes down? Um, what happens if we don't invest the money that we need to in digital resources going forward? Obviously, there are broadband um, Wi-Fi you know, connectivity deserts in our state. It makes it challenging not just for us to do our work, but for business, education, and telehealth um, to continue in a state of emergency. There was a sense that, in general, across state government, we need clear, concise, and widely accessible online portals for people to get information from different departments that it really varies from agency to agency and department to department, but we might want to have a rubric for scoring how well information is provided. That was certainly something that came uh, to the fore really quickly at Department of Labor. That in general, there was information there, but it wasn't well organized. It was very frustrating for folks. So we talked about what if the grid goes down, what's the backup plan, as Chris said, if we can't access the electricity we need. And in general, have we done a good job of examining the vulnerability of all of our systems? Okay. Number of people mentioned that although it has been helpful to have Zoom meetings, something is lost in these committee meetings. Uh, there's no opportunity for side conversations, smaller groups coming together to flesh through, uh, flesh out an idea or a policy. The work takes longer and is often very choppy. Um, I think that's all I wanna say about that. There was a feeling that we don't actually have a good handle as legislators on what the state's contingency plans are for emergencies. Where are they housed? Who's in charge of them? We probably should be briefing ourselves on what these plans are so we have a general sense. Um, and also what are the contingency plans for the capital complex going forward? Another theme that emerged is what we notice is that humans need to step in sooner uh, when we have a crisis bubbling up with technology. Again, coming back to the Department of Labor, question, you know, you've got emails and recorded messages that were going out, um, but they weren't the answer. They weren't reassuring people. They were creating more problems than they were solving. A lingering worry uh, coming out of finance is we don't just have to refill our reserves, that we need to make sure we have reserves and then some. Um, we're in a better state than a, a better position in many states with the reserves that we had, but we're still not in a good position. And so that, that's very alarming to know that we did set aside the, the rainy day funds, but they're, they're not enough when faced with this uh, unprecedented uh, financial calamity. Um, 
other lingering worries uh, as we head into election season and we're out of shock mode for the initial part of the emergency, will we, be, will we continue to have good communication with the administration and across party lines and across chambers? How are we gonna build a recovery when we have no money in our budget right now? Like even if we are able to identify the things that need to be done, how will we do it when we're facing like a half a billion dollars in short, shortfall uh, in the, the revenues coming in? We're still haunted by our bad um, IT track record. How are we gonna change that? How are we gonna do better going forward when we know it not just doesn't just take uh, investments of money, but also people, highly qualified people to maintain those systems. Um, and I think I'm gonna keep it at that high level right now. We have to hear more information from education and health and welfare to, to, to wrap this up. But it's been interesting to hear Chris's uh, report and to read through yours last night, Randy, and just see how there are there are general themes that are emerging that will point us in the right direction. Great. Question? Uh, any questions for Becca? I, I have a question for the two of you. You mentioned Tim um, said we could finalize the report early next week. Do you want, do you expect us to be finished by Thursday or Friday or what? By Friday, yes. Okay. By, by Friday, that way we can then take the individual committee reports and then create a final product that incorporates information from all of them in a in a, a logic, hopefully a logical way. Okay. Uh, in terms of what uh, our our group found, uh, many of them are the same themes that that Chris and Becca have 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 described. They're they're in common. Uh, I think one of the, the themes, of course, is that the Senate did an outstanding job in everything that it did. Of course, we knew that finding was going to come anyway. But uh, among the things that we did well is uh, we, we did demonstrate as a state the ability to react quickly to an unprecedented situation and to work together, putting partisanship aside in, in the face of the crisis. And, and I think that was something that I think we should all be proud of. Uh, we demonstrated ability to listen to the expert and, and to be guided by the science. And the governor's communications to the public, as, uh, as, as, as Becca, you have said, uh, had a calming effect and also uh, gave people confidence in the fact that their government was doing something that hopefully to, to most people at least made, made sense. Uh, our fundamental continuity of government and emergency operations plans, although not designed for this type of crisis, actually seemed to work reasonably well. And the fact that we had such planning, uh, although it was uneven in a few places, but by and large, plans were in place and, and reasonably up to date. Uh, we demonstrated an ability to be flexible, such as require, uh, relaxing uh, uh, some licensing rules, relaxing procurement rules in the face of an emergency to be able to respond more nimbly than we could ordinarily in the normal course of business. Uh, so those things are things I think we could say went reasonably well. There, of course, are, were opportunities for improvement. Uh, the federal response for uh, PPE was inadequate. And for those people who are managing the emergency, that's one of the recurring themes that we heard. But what that said is, should we have been better prepared? And is there something that we need to do uh, for, in effect, the next crisis to make sure that we are not so entirely reliant on, on help that might not come? Uh, one theme was better coordination was needed between legislative leadership and legislative staff. In some cases, that coordination was not as good or as smooth as, as, as it should have been. Uh, there was a lack to some extent of a broad contingency planning view. In other words, limited outside of the box thinking about the kinds of risks that we face. We were prepared for hurricanes and floods, but we weren't particularly well prepared for this. Although we reacted and and, and change direction and, and very, very quickly. Uh, we need better planning for communication with elected official staff and the administration. In other words, just the basic things in place like a list of everybody's cell phone numbers uh, to be able to contact folks uh, outside the office uh, if, if need be. Uh, we need to do risk assessment and uh, prioritization for upgrade or replacement of older critical IT systems. And the, uh, our focus on doing something like repairing and replacing 
the Department of Labor system, which we knew was was elderly and and written in code that people don't use today. And uh, these are things that we knew, but we didn't perhaps place as high a priority because we weren't anticipating the kinds of surge that actually happened. And so one of the questions uh, that, you know, I'm jumping ahead to what we should do to prepare for the next crisis is make sure that we have an assessment of all of our systems. And although the UI system was the problem here, what system might be the problem in a different kind of crisis that we may face next time that we should be thinking about now. Uh, broadband and cellular coverage uh, was at the top of the list for it, and almost everyone we talked with. Uh, we have uh, this need to communicate, to do uh, medical uh, uh, telemedicine, to deal with education, to communicate among ourselves, uh, to uh, deal with the business uh, community uh, throughout the state. All of those things suggest that we need to pay uh, priority attention to ensuring that we do in fact deliver adequate broadband, not just limited broadband, but adequate broadband across Vermont to the people who don't have it because uh, in a crisis like this, they are in effect left out of the picture. Um, of the things that we should do better to prepare for the next crisis, obviously we must expand broadband and cellular coverage as, uh, as one of our highest priority. We should rethink the depth of succession planning for potential loss of leadership in executive and legislative branches. Um, you know, for example, in the federal government, when there's a joint session, at least one member of the cabinet is off site just in the event that the Capitol blows up, for example. We don't do that in Vermont. And in fact, the depth of our succession planning stops at the Secretary of State. There are no designated succession planning after that. And when we have a joint session of the legislature, everybody's in the same place at the same time. And in terms of a risk, that's a huge risk that we perhaps should, should, should address. Succession planning is also an issue elsewhere in state government within, within some of our, our departments and functions that we need to think about. We need to look at legislative IT redundancy and also the risk of, key, of loss of key staff. Uh, we picture, for example, the tax department. Let's say you have a disaster in which the tax department uh, is blown up in a terrorist strike. Well, we have the systems available so that they are offsite. And so the loss of data risk is minimal, but who's gonna run it if the people in the tax department are blown up? That's the piece of contingency planning that we don't really have. And we have this in, in a lot of places. And it's very, very difficult, we know, in a small state to deal with that, but at least we need to, to think through things like that. We need to assess the full range of risks and rate them relative to probability, impact, and preparedness. What probability-based risks should we be planning for now that are different than the ones that we have, we have seen before? Uh, as Chris mentioned, for example, the loss of, uh, of the grid or key uh, energy sources is one that I don't think we've really thought through. Uh, we should consider how the General Assembly would meet if a joint meeting were required and social distancing were, were needed. Now, what New Hampshire did, as I understand it, is the Senate meets in the House chamber where there's room to be able to do social distancing and the House meets uh, somewhere externally. And I know that in the, in the planning that's being done by uh, the Sergeant at Arms and the Capitol uh, Police Chief, they are thinking about locations where these things could happen elsewhere. So that planning is being at least thought through, but I'm not sure that the leadership from our perspective uh, to them is as, as, as robust as it perhaps should be. Uh, as uh, some of you, Becca and, and Chris have mentioned, we need a better and more intelligent uh, information portal, the ability to uh, pass information on uh, to people, particularly citizens who need them. And we saw this particularly in the, the issue of the Department of Labor issues. And this though potentially presents some tremendous opportunity for us. The opportunity is to be able to use uh, 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 artificial intelligence and robotics uh, more effectively to be able to build intelligent portals. Uh, you know, one, for example, you, and one, I, I spoke with a, a person who's in the artificial intelligence business and the innovation business. And one of the things you mentioned is, you know, why don't you do something like put a tape recorder at the Department of Motor Vehicles all day and listen to what people ask and then build 
artificial intelligence to answer those questions effectively. And think if we had done that from the beginning with the ability of a recorded line uh, to route the calls that were coming into the Department of Labor into a more intelligent response system, uh, uh, that may have been a way to alleviate some of the issues that we had and also give Vermonters more confidence as opposed to being on a phone line, uh, not being able to get through for days and in some cases, weeks at a time. Uh, connectivity uh, is critical, just to reemphasize again, the broadband piece, but then we have to ask ourselves, well, what happens if there was no, there's no internet availability? What do we do then? I don't have an answer to that. Um, any questions on that piece or if, if Cheryl or, or Dick, you have anything to add? Uh, Randy, yeah, just am I on? Oh, go ahead, go Cheryl. Ahead, no, you. <laughs> Becca, um, you had mentioned point person, and we heard that as well, that there needs to be a more um, prominent, I guess, dissemination of the information because some systems were getting directives from different places and not getting the same information. So that's something that I think that we need to look at and uh, people have talked about, and especially in the emergency um, systems that are set up throughout the state, you know, if you're getting directives from health and you're getting directives from um, public safety and you're getting directives from here and there, where does it come together so that you know what you should be doing at any one time? I think uh, with, are you done Cheryl? I didn't mean to interrupt, okay. Um, I think with, with the, uh, the disaster uh, at UI, uh, I, I think first of all, it was just a question of scale. When you compare the number of UI applications handled pre-COVID with what got dumped on the department, with the, is it, I, I can't imagine actually creating and maintaining a system large enough to take care of, of that volume and then having it in, in normal times, there'll be, uh, uh, it was, and, and to, to for, yeah, I, I kind of forgive the Department of Labor. I don't see how they could have been, been ready for it. But having said that, and I'm gonna sound like a, a cranky old curmudgeon here, but I think there were fundamental problems with the computerized setup that had nothing to do with COVID. It's a problem that sort of just is ubiquitous wherever people use computers. And it's this, that, it's not a problem with the technology, it's a problem with the use of language and the organizing of information online. I think the people who program the computers know a lot about computers. They don't know a lot about logic. And I say that because there are some computer programs that are actually very logical. There's something called Westlaw. And it's very obvious that it was not put together by computer people. It was put together by lawyers. And there's an orderliness. If you want to find a piece of information, you basically play 20 questions. You start with a whole universe. You keep dividing the possibilities. And you're creating smaller and smaller universes. But the questions cover that entire universe. The problem with people trying to sign up for UI it was very simple. They would get a question like, what were your 2019 wages? Well, that's a stupid question because not everybody works for wages. Some people get salaries. Some people are sole proprietorships. Some people you know, are, um, are, are living on royalties. What you need is a, a question that embraces all the possibilities. For example, a menu of the various ways to get paid and which of these is you. And one of those should be other. And that's just, that, and that is so basic. If you've ever had kids and you play in the car on a long trip, you play 20 questions. You keep dividing the possibilities. And that has nothing to do with technology. That's about how, or, how information is organized. And if the one, the most common complaint I've got, well, the most common complaint I've gotten about UI is just not being able to get through at all, is getting a busy signal. It's just get, leaving a voicemail and getting no answer. But if people who actually could analyze what their problem was, invariably, it was that they got a question on the computer screen 
that they couldn't answer. They needed at that point to talk to a human being, not because they hate the computer. They needed to talk to a human being because the computer program did not envision their situation. Uh, and they couldn't get a human being. So I think we need to clean up our act with our computer programs, but we also need to provide for a bailout when, when the computer is not working, that we should just not assume that everything is gonna be done online because it doesn't always work. That's it. Thank I'm you. gonna go, go chase the kids off my lawn now. <laughs> Brian. Yeah, I, I agree with Dick. Um, one of the more common complaints I heard with that whole issue of claiming was if you got to a certain point and answered the correct uh, the question incorrectly, it completely threw everything else out and you could never get back to where you needed to be to fix it without getting somebody involved on a, on a, a personal level. So I, I think Dick points out a very good situation where you can't structure something so tightly that if you inadvertently give it a wrong answer, you are tilt out of the system and then it takes you another week to get back in to fix it. Just an observation. Well, that, that's exactly what I was talking about when I talk about artificial intelligence, that you have systems like UI that were built 30 years ago and people who are building really effective information technology today don't build it that way for that very reason. It, Anybody else have any, any comment at yeah, this point? A couple of things uh, came to light from your report. One is uh, very obvious with UI, but um, Perhaps more broadly, I think we may want to suggest that that the legislature have points of contact in different agencies. Mm -hmm. We were sort of all scrambling to figure out where to send people or ourselves where to contact. And then uh, Sorokin and Becca and you guys gave us a few names at DOL, and that made a huge difference. But uh, you know, f a few days ago, I was trying to help a business connect with ACCD and I was like, I don't know where to send you really, to be honest. So that might be a good idea for us to just have a list that, that they designate somebody um, that, that legislators can turn to. And, and I'll just take this opportunity to say that Jessica Vintner at DOL is like a, she's amazing. She, she, I call her the wizard. Yeah. She, yeah, I would she's agree. So great. And you know, she has a little baby at home. Yes. She, she once responded, well, I'll get to that. Um, my kid's about to go down for a nap. <laughs> um, which, which uh, brings up the second point. Um, you referenced staff, Randy, for this, for the legislature. Um, I think we should pull that out a little bit more because. We are um, tough on our staff. Uh, we're very demanding. We, de we demand a lot of intense hours. And that's normally under the context and we forgive ourselves because, well, you only have this nightmarish situation for five months of the year. And then, then you have this vision of a luxury office with nobody around. And so two things. Um, this dynamic has shoved, of course, the staff and the challenges they've had, and they've all answered, as far as I can tell, amazingly. Um, but they're in the home front. They're wrestling with kids. If Luke had four kids at home, you know, what would have happened? I, I'm not sure we, we – I don't believe he has any kids. But, uh, you know, that is a dynamic that we are vulnerable to, and it's worth – flagging and i think going forward we've got to acknowledge that we maybe need to adjust our expectations since this is not five months of intense work and since people are juggling a whole a lot of other things as they're having to work from home and I, I you know i don't know if it's worth checking in with the legislative council committee or what but it strikes me that we um just sort of barreled through as if wherever they were, they would keep acting the way we expect in the state house. And, and that's probably not a fair expectation. Good point. Uh, 
we uh, reached out to both uh, legislative council and also to JFO for their specific input. Uh, and although I've had conversations with Luke, he wanted to have a little bit more time to come up with a deliberate response, which he says he'll be providing to, to me in the next day or two. Uh, and, but it does focus on some of the very issues, Chris, that, that you mentioned as, as, as Luke and I talked about it at a, at a high level. Uh, we also today, uh, I believe Joyce is on the call and I did get some input back from, from JFO regarding their observations of lessons learned. Uh, and Joyce, could you perhaps give us the high points of that? Yes, certainly. Uh, so, so we would echo many of the thoughts that have been expressed already. Uh, we felt that we were able to get to work pretty quickly. Everyone adapted to working at home quite well. Um, we did have the problem that we didn't have cell phones for people outside of JFO and that slowed down things a little bit at the beginning. Uh, we felt that our revenue forecasters worked pretty well. They were able to communicate effectively and share data and so forth. So that seemed to go fine. Uh, there were some areas that have been a little bit more of a struggle. So for example, just figuring out how to communicate with people that you don't bump into in the Pink Lady or that you don't bump into in the State House, all of that has been rather strange, I would say. Um, it's also true that we did not have a legislative plan for emergency disruptions. We, we did not know how to respond in that situation. So we made a lot of ad hoc adjustments that turned out to be fine, but it would be nice to think through the process in advance for the next time. Um, there were some issues in terms of uh, the way that the, the fiscal situation has been working. Um, there have been some times when we felt that communication between the legislature and the administration were perhaps not, not ideal. So for example, um, the administration decided rather quickly to hop onto the federal timing of, of uh, income tax due dates. So that got pushed into the next fiscal year, which meant that all of a sudden we had this big problem of a large shortfall in uh, revenues coming in for the current fiscal year. So if there had been more communication, we might've been able to think through some of the implications. It's also true that we've recently gone through setting up an RFP, well, I shouldn't say we, the administration has, has uh, set up an RFP to hire somebody to help manage the coronavirus relief funds coming from the federal government. And I think if the legislature had been more involved in that process, we might have done things a little bit differently. So again, there are these cases where decisions were made quickly and maybe they had to be made quickly, but a little bit more communication between the, the branches of government might have helped. Uh, plenty of people have talked about the unemployment insurance program. There's a nice chart on the JFO webpage showing how from 1987 to um, February of this year, uh, the uh, unemployment insurance claims were sort of bouncing along and all of a sudden we have this gigantic spike. Uh, so it was really out of scale uh, compared to anything that we had seen before. No one's mentioned childcare, but I think that is an area that, that needs to be thought through. That's, that's crucial for so many people in the economy and of course for our kids. Um, and uh, boy, I don't think many people had thought through the implications of, of an emergency like, like we're in now for childcare. And of course, food needs have been mentioned as well. So just quickly, what could be changed now? Of course, we talked about broadband for everyone so that all employees and all kids <laughs> can work from home. Um, we would like to have a, a legislative plan for any future emergency disruptions. And in terms of the, the fiscal side of things, we, we feel that it's necessary to maintain the legislative role in spending and revenue decisions while understanding that sometimes somebody has to make a quick decision to spend money and other folks will find out about it later. So that has to happen in some cases, but we'd like to minimize that as much as possible. 
Great, thank you, thank you very much, Joyce. Uh, does anyone else have anything to add at this point? Uh, places that we should go that we haven't, uh, areas that we should explore in, in looking at the remainder of this project? Randy, I just wanted to go back to the um, UI situation. And I agree with what Dick and what Joyce has said about the really fast um, uptick of you know the number of cases and stuff. And so we can't blame it all on the, the department, but a lot of the complaints that I've heard come from the interaction of claimants with the call takers and especially with um, the you know company that was brought on to um, help fill in the gaps there. And, and I know that it had to be done quickly, but uh, I think that we need to talk about making sure that those people who are on the other end of the phone have been trained at least in um, how to be a little more respectful of the claimants when they call. Randy. Yeah, I, I wonder, Joyce mentioned childcare, which is a good reminder, and, and we haven't looked at schools. Um, and I, I, you know. We're, yeah, we're waiting to get that information from that okay. committee. Yep. Okay, good. Yeah, no, there's, there's a lot of information there that needs to be mined still. Mm -hmm. And that, that will be important for tweaks or, you know, as we think about the fall. My wife's a high school teacher, as, as you know, and, and they just yesterday in staff meeting started wondering, you know, should we be ready in case we're not in the classroom? What would that look like? And it's a grisly thing to think about at this moment, but we owe that to people. Yeah, the, the whole piece of education is, is, is critical. And uh, we have the note also of dealing with the higher education, not simply K through 12, because there are there are obviously implications uh, that we have there that in fact go beyond COVID, but perhaps are exacerbated by COVID. Uh, on, on that note, we have uh, four minutes to go before our time is over. Uh, what we, uh, the next step in this process is uh, that we will continue our data collection uh, by the three groups during the course of this week, refining these draft reports uh, based on what we've heard today and the information that we collect during the week. Uh, the three subgroup leaders are meeting again on Thursday, by which time we hope we will have collected uh, everything that we're, we're going to collect given the limited time that we have, and then uh, present those things to this full group again on Friday afternoon uh, uh, or on Friday of, of, of this week. Then over the weekend, uh, we will complete the actual report process with the notion of delivering it by Tuesday morning. Uh, in the meantime, after listening today and thinking about it, each of you, if you have things that you've thought about that we haven't covered today or that ought to be covered or that ought to be addressed, uh, would appreciate it if you would just send a, an email at least to uh, Becca, to Chris and myself uh, that we can use as a basis uh, to, to perhaps add some more ideas and and, and things that we need to do to this process. Uh, before we close today, is there anything else that anyone uh, would like to add? Well, again, thank you all so much. I know this is a, a great deal of work, a great deal of burden, uh, a great deal of thought, but I hope we'll have a product that will at least be useful in, in the short run and in, in the medium term going forward. And thank you again so much, and we'll see you on the floor. See you on the, see you on the floor.